Hello everyone, <clears throat> I'm Danny Alexander from UCL and I'm going to talk to you about the Europond project. So Europond was funded within the systems medicine call of the Horizon 2020 programme. Project started at the beginning of 2016 and runs to the end of this year. The consortium consists of eight sites from six countries across Europe and it brings together technical researchers in computer science, statistics, and image analysis with biomedical and clinical researchers in neurology, radiology, and epide epidemiology, all focused on the aim of better understanding the progression of neurological disease through computational modeling. So it was this kind of picture that really motivated the work that we embarked on within Europond. This sort of hypothetical model of the, the way disease progresses, uh, Alzheimer's disease specifically, progresses from early stages to late stages, really came off the back of the availability of large patient data sets that appeared about 10 or more years ago. And it, it marked a transition from thinking of the disease really as sort of a list of symptoms and pathologies for, to thinking about it as an evolving set of symptoms and pathologies that have a, a, a distinct ordering and, and timeline. And while this kind of hypothetical model is really useful for understanding the biology of the disease, uh, they're not quantitative and so they lack the ability to provide quantitative measurement and, and prediction. Around about the time that we were writing the Europond proposal, various groups around the world were starting to think about how we might generate this kind of uh, picture that represents this hypothetical model, but more directly from fitting computational models to measured data. At UCL, for example, we were developing what we now refer to as discrete models, such as the event-based model, which simply tries to estimate an ordering of biomarkers in which they show abnormality. Other groups were working on what we now call continuous trajectory models. So identifying a, a trajectory of each of a set of biomarkers all on a common timeline. Other groups, this is work from Stanley Derleman and co in, in Paris, were working on spatiotemporal models that try to show the evolution of a whole image of the brain uh, during, over the, the course of, of the disease. So building on these kind of early steps, these were the key objectives that we identified in the Europond proposal. I'm going to sort of slightly paraphrase them here to, to kind of better represent what we've actually done within the project. <clears throat> but one of the main objectives was to bring together these early steps on modeling the, the progression of disease into a, uh, a new computational and statistical modeling framework that gives us the flexibility to pick and choose the various features of the different algorithms that people have developed and tailor them towards specific applications. One of the other aims was to generate a quantitative validation framework. Much of the early work was really kind of evaluated largely qualitatively, just evaluating against the sort of intuition and hypothetical models that were around, against, uh, around at the time. Uh, but we wanted to turn this into a more quantitative science by identifying a set of appropriate performance metrics that we could evaluate the different models against. Then another of the key aims was to roll out these models that we've developed from their initial application, which was typically an Alzheimer's disease where the bulk of the data existed, and roll them out to a, a, a number of uh, other neurological conditions and, and potentially beyond. The final objective there was to generate a prototype computer-assisted diagnosis system that exploits these predictive temporal models, uh, enabling clinicians and other users to exploit them uh, in frontline applications. And the idea is that we'd concentrate on dementia for that demonstration, uh, paving the way to produce similar systems in the future for other neurological conditions and beyond. So the, these were the application areas that we identified to focus on within Europond. So it's a fairly diverse set of uh, neurological conditions. So I've got dementia and multiple sclerosis here, 
uh, grouped together here because they both tend to exhibit fairly slow uh, neurodegeneration. As I said, we started, the early work was in Alzheimer's disease, and we were looking to roll that out to a number of other uh, dementia type conditions. Um, then we also had a work package on prion disease. Um, and although this also has neurodegeneration uh, component to it, this is a much more rapid progression. And that rapid progression presents some distinct technical challenges to the slower progression that we observed in, observe in these longer term diseases. And we also had a focus on more natural aging uh, and development processes. So at different ends of the, the lifetime, a pop, some work on population aging and some other work on neurodevelopment. So the, the idea there is that with this diverse collection of applications for these models, we could generate uh, a toolkit of these modeling algorithms that would be flexible enough to accommodate this set of applications and a much broader set in the future. So with that in mind, this, this is the structure of the, the consortium. So we had several groups who were focused on developing the, the methods and bringing together the existing methods and pushing them forward uh, together. Then we had several applications groups who were focused on and have access to unique and large data sets from specific application areas. Um, and those, to, so the methods feed through to those applications and those then feed through in turn to our translational activities led by our industry partner Icometrics. So I'm going to talk first about various modeling advances that we made during the course of the Europon project. I'll then talk about the applications and how we managed to push those forward using those modeling advances. I'll talk then about some of the translational activities within the project and finish by talking about some future and emerging themes, which I think, I think and hope we'll continue to work on beyond the end of Europond. So early advances were made on the uh, discrete models and the event-based model. So in particular, uh, the development of the discriminative event-based model by Vikram Venkat Raghavan and colleagues in, in Rotterdam. <clears throat> and this uh, just produced a kind of a more robust and accurate version of the original EBM that uh, they managed to show in this original paper produces more accurate uh, predictive results than, than the original and can be more stable and efficient in, in certain situations. And there are several applications of the discriminative EBM that you can find at this uh, at the Compage meeting. At the other end of the complexity scale, the EBM is a very, very simple model. Uh, Igor Koval and colleagues at IMSERM developed the, uh, the digital brain and this is a, so this is a comprehensive model that combines a spatiotemporal model of the brain and how it uh, evolves in structure during the course of the disease, all on the same timeline as the evolution of various non-imaging scalar biomarkers. And all of these can be conditioned on various, on the, the clinical status of the patient, their genetics, their lifestyle factors uh, and so on. So it's a very comprehensive model providing great power for, uh, uh, for prediction and, and stratification. And Igor's got uh, a couple of abstracts at the Compage meeting, both pushing forward the methodology for this and applying it in different contexts, in particular to the Huntington's disease. We also developed various Gaussian process-based models. So Marco Lorenzi in particular develop these nice um, spatiotemporal models using Gaussian processes and Neil Ox to be developed some scalar trajectory models using Gaussian processes. The nice thing about these is that they capture not just the typical trajectory but also the variation over the population or cohort get captured very nicely by, by the Gaussian process enabling us to understand better the heterogeneity uh, within a cohort. And speaking about heterogeneity, another of the key advances within the Europon project has been the development of SUSTAIN. So this is a, 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 an algorithm that uniquely enables us to disentangle temporal heterogeneity, changes that occur over time, from intrinsic 
phenotypic <coughs> heterogeneity, individuals that progress along distinct timelines. And so what it provides us with is data-driven subtypes, each defined by its own trajectory of change during the disease, uh, providing us great new possibilities for precision medicine. And these are some early results that came from Alzheimer's disease, identifying three strongly distinct subtypes defined by distinct uh, accumulation of atrophy over the brain. And Alex pushes forward the, the, the model at the Compage meeting, and you can also see several applications of this in various different areas. So let's move on and talk about some applications. So there's been a lot of output on the application side from Europon, and I'm not going to attempt to cover everything. I'm just going to pick one or two examples from each of the application areas that we considered. So let me start with dementia. I mean, obviously, Digital Brain and Sustain have produced some, uh, some fantastic new insights into the temporal evolution of uh, Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. But I want to focus on this work from the, from the Brescia group from Damiano Archetti and, and colleagues, uh, which has a more translational flavor to it. So I think this is particularly exciting because what they've done here is to show that models, simple models here, event-based model and discriminative EBM, trained on high quality research data sets, still work nicely when you apply them to much grungier real world clinical data, which is what they they're showing results from the test set here. And this is extremely important because it, it tells us that the kinds of models we've built on these rich uh, research data sets can actually have real world utility on, uh, on real world clinical data. So I think that you know, this shows great promise for the future translation uh, of the kinds of models that we've been developing within Europol. Lots of work on uh, normal aging from the Rotterdam group, exploiting the rich data in, in the Rotterdam study. This was an early publication by Elena Vinka and colleagues in, in Rotterdam, uh, where she's showing trajectories of change as a, a function of age, uh, of various markers derived from, from MRI, and contrasting the changes that uh, we observe in men um, and in women. And elena has got some very nice work in the pipeline using sustain to identify distinct subgroups of people who follow different aging trajectories. Um, so we're looking forward to that work maturing. Moving to multiple sclerosis, again looking at sustain here, this is some very nice work from Armin Ashagi, who identifies several subtypes of Alzheimer's disease by defined by uh, atrophy pattern, uh, or not just atrophy, but uh, features observed in, in MRI and shows nicely that these different subtypes uh, identify or uh, are predictive of who will respond to, to certain treatments. And then some other work within this uh, application from the Amsterdam team, Victor Vochel uh, and, and colleagues, who are looking at multimodal data sets and using simple models like discriminative EBM to identify orderings of uh, these biomarkers showing abnormality in different subgroups of, uh, of MS patients. Very exciting work going on in, in the prion disease work package. So this is work from Alberto Bitsi and Ricardo Vascuso in, uh, in Milan. Here they're comparing different progression patterns that emerge in the different genetic subtypes of, of prion disease. Uh, and showing that these, these uh, can really be, be quite different. And there's ongoing work on, on this, again, using sustain uh, to derive data-driven subtypes to see how those contrast with the genetically defined uh, subgroups. Finally, neurodevelopment. So this has probably been the most challenging application to, to make progress on, just because you know, the, the development process is so different to the the degenerative processes in, in the diseases and aging that we've been looking at uh, elsewhere. Nevertheless, we're starting to make some progress on this. This is results from collaboration between Neil Oxterby and, the, and Petra Huppi and, and the uh, Geneva group using Gaussian process models to, uh, to look at trajectories of change in some of their data sets from, from babies and, and young kids. 
So let's move on and uh, think about translation and outreach and some of the activities within the Europond project. So this is some beautiful work again from the, the, the Rotterdam team. Uh, the Aging Brain Simulator is a web application that uh, allows a, a user to look at the normative distribution of brain shape and size as a function of age. Uh, and they can then use that to explore features that they might have observed in, a, in a, another data set to help them decide whether those features are outside the normative range representing some abnormality or actually for a particular age group are uh, within the normal range. The work led by Icometrics developing or trying to embed some of the technology emerging from Europond in their web-based uh, applications is uh, moving forward very nicely. So this is just a, a demo of their system. But again, you know, much like the aging brain simulator enables us to place individuals on a normative range, uh, taking into account their age, their stage within a disease and various biomarkers that we may have acquired from, from these individuals. Um, and there's several bits of work uh, ongoing that are reported at the Compage meeting, both on the design of this, uh, or the design process for this, for this system and the predictive ability of the underlying models. The Tadpole Challenge has been a, a major activity within the Europon project. So this was a, an international community challenge, uh, bringing people together to try and get the best computational techniques out there to make predictions on who would progress to full Alzheimer's disease over a, a sort of moderate time scale of a, a year or two. It was a collaboration with the, uh, the ADNI consortium and substantial prizes were put up by the, the Alzheimer's disease charities. We had around 100 submissions of forecasts to the challenge and the results were actually uh, announced last year. Uh, the results are all on, on the website if you're interested in there and uh, the paper should be published uh, fairly soon hopefully. So let's move on to some, some future directions. So obviously there's huge scope for applying these the kinds of models and algorithms that we've developed in a, in a much wider range of application areas. So even beyond the, the fairly small number of neurological applications that we explore within Europond, we're already looking at a range of others. Uh, at this meeting, you'll see applications of these ideas in Huntington's disease, in Parkinson's disease, in motor neuron disease, and there are many other neurological conditions which I think we can uh, start to understand better with the application of the, uh, these kinds of models. Um, but this, the example I've chosen to illustrate this is actually looking beyond neurology into respiratory disease. So this recent publication uh, from Alex Young uses sustain to identify distinct trajectories within chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, which is uh, equally very exciting for, for, for that community. And there are many other applications starting to emerge for these kinds of algorithm in all sorts of chronic diseases. I mentioned in passing that, you know, one of the great powers of the, the, the kind of technique that we've been developing is to, uh, to reveal hidden associations with early life risk factors, which are perhaps not apparent when uh, exploring a cohort as a whole. So particularly the ability of models like Gaussian process models and sustain to unravel, to some extent at least, the heterogeneity of these cohorts enables us to find associations, perhaps with just particular subgroups that we can't see when considering uh, the population as a whole. And some early steps here on, in particular, looking at associations between genetics uh, and disease manifestation from both Marco Lorenzi and, and Alex Young. But I think there's, there's a, a huge potential for this in the future. And in fact, this is the focus of a, one of the follow-on projects I'll mention later, uh, EDADS. Another area where I think there's great potential in the future is, is to use feature learning in combination with, uh, with disease progression modeling. So one of the things we can learn, I think, from the, the deep learning revolution is that by simultaneously estimating features from complex structured data like images and a model that we're trying to derive from that, that data tends to provide much stronger models than if we identify the features manually beforehand and then 
construct a, you know, a, a subsequent model. And we've been rather stuck in that traditional uh, approach so far, I think, in disease progression modeling, where we derive a number of image features first and then explore what the trajectory of those image features is over the course of a disease. But I think by combining those two steps, potentially we can get some much more powerful models in the future. And this slide is just showing some early progress on that idea from Raz Marinescu, who simultaneously groups voxels on the brain surface and identifies the trajectory of change in, in, those, uh, in those voxels over time. But much more potential there, I think, for example, combining those ideas with uh, algorithms like Sustain. This is some uh, very nice recent work from Daniele Ravi uh, using some sophisticated deep learning technology to identify highly personalized trajectories of individuals from a single image snapshot but conditioned on their clinical status. So he uses deep learning and generative uh, models to produce trajectories of image change over time from that starting point conditioned on whether an individual is cognitively normal or diagnosed as Alzheimer's disease and so on. Now, I think this is uh, very powerful for, uh, for example, for providing data augmentation for training model systems in the future uh, or for generating virtual cohorts for clinical trials. Um, and Daniele is going to present more on the, uh, the latest uh, updates on this technology later in this meeting. And then finally, one of the things that we've moved into in the last couple of years of the Europon project is to move away a little bit from the largely phenomenological models that Europon set out to focus on. You know, the models uh, tend to identify patterns in the data rather than trying to explain why those patterns occur. Uh, so we've started to think in somewhat more mechanistic terms, which I think dovetails very nicely with the, the other project that's the focus of this meeting, the Radar AD project. Um, you know, once we can reveal these patterns of temporal change, we can start to use those to make inferences about what underlying mechanisms are driving those changes. And some early work on this by Sarah Garbarino last year um, approaches this by uh, constructing computational models, encoding a number of hypothetical mechanisms of how Alzheimer's pathology spreads over the brain as, whether, as, as well as other pathologies like multiple sclerosis and just simple normal aging. And then predicts temporal patterns of, uh, of change from those computational models and evaluates them against the patterns that we can observe with uh, Gaussian process models. Along a similar line, this is work from Armin Ashagi again in multiple sclerosis, trying to identify uh, the causal relationships between uh, between changes that occur in the brain and the administration of, of, of certain treatments. So all sorts of scope, I think, for new ideas emerging from Europon to turn into follow-on projects. A couple that have been funded already uh, here, as I, I mentioned earlier, the EDADS project funded by uh, JPND. Um, and the, the idea of this is to try to use early life markers and risk factors to predict what clinical manifestation or what subtype of disease uh, a particular individual might, uh, might take later, later in life. Then the IAIM project is a personal fellowship for Neil Oxterby from the UKRI, which is looking at clinical applications, sorry, applications of these models in clinical trials, as well as pushing forward some of the ideas I mentioned on um, exploring underlying mechanisms. So that's all I'm going to say. I think it just uh, remains for me to thank, first of all, the European Commission for funding this work. Uh, it's been a fantastic project and a pleasure to coordinate throughout. Um, big thanks to Neil Oxterby, who's been a fantastic scientific manager throughout the Europond project and really kept the, the show on the road. And a big thank to everybody in the Europond consortium for making it such a pleasure uh, to coordinate and for their engagement and enthusiasm throughout. I'd just like to mention our software page uh, at the end. We've had an open source software philosophy throughout the project and so many of the tools that I've mentioned can be found um, on the Europond website at that link there. And uh, thank you for listening.